This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Shout out to the homie Cody Legro for holding it down in my absence. With friends like that, why even come to work? Anyway, here's what we got for y'all. Minnesota has become an epicenter of activity related to violence and policing. We'll hear from one of our reporters on the ground. Plus, virtual worship has spread during the pandemic. We'll look into how this has affected places of worship and whether it'll stick around in the future. But first, here's what you need to know right now. Health officials are calling for a pause in the U.S. rollout of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine over new concerns of side effects, and many states are heeding that advice, stopping the flow of that vaccine. It's the kind of thing that sounds kind of scary as a headline until you actually look at the details. So let's break this down a bit. The suggested pause for J&J &J vaccines comes after blood clots were found in six people who received the vaccine out of nearly 7 million people who received the shot in the US. So just for the record here, that minuscule risk of blood clots with J&J &J is even lower than the risk with the AstraZeneca vaccine being used around the world outside of the US. And those risks are far lower than the risk of blood clots for some other types of medication, for example, women taking oral contraception for birth control, aka the pill. The FDA and CDC say they're recommending the pause out of an abundance of caution, but the decision could have a real impact on public trust in vaccines. At the White House today, Dr. Fauci fielded questions on whether the pause could do more harm than good. You want to make sure that safety is the important issue here. We are totally aware that this is a very rare event. We want to get this worked out as quickly as we possibly can. And that's why you see the word pause. Meanwhile, the Biden administration has been downplaying the challenge it poses in the wider vaccine rollout. The J&J &J shot has made up less than 5% of all COVID vaccines given in the US so far. America's forever war could be ending, though later than planned. President Joe Biden says he plans a full withdrawal of all troops in Afghanistan by September 11th. That same day will mark 20 years since the terror attacks of 9-11. The move will keep thousands of soldiers in Afghanistan beyond May 1st of this year. That was the deadline the Trump administration negotiated with the Taliban. The Taliban vowed to renew attacks on US and NATO personnel if troops weren't out by then, but it's unclear if they will follow through on the threats with this phased out approach. Biden is expected to make the official announcement Wednesday. Hands up! Don't shoot! Hands up! There was unrest and outrage for a second night in Minnesota. It's in reaction to two deaths under different circumstances, months apart, but protesters also see glaring similarities. I'm gonna be out here every day. I'm gonna be out here until they give us some justice. Until they make a change, I'm gonna be out here. According to police, Dante Wright was accidentally shot and killed after getting pulled over this weekend in Brooklyn Center. The officer says she meant to reach for her taser. She's a 26 year veteran on the force. Wright was just 20 years old and a father to a one year old. As people take to the streets in his name and share their thoughts on social media, there's an echoed sentiment. He should still be here. My heart is literally broken into a thousand pieces and I don't know what to do or what to say, but I just need everybody to know that he is much more than this. Meanwhile, 10 miles away in Minneapolis, the defense in Derek Chauvin's trial began their case after the state wrapped up theirs. He's on trial for the murder of George Floyd. The defense is expected to focus on Floyd's drug use to try and prove it may have contributed to Floyd's death. Prosecutors had several experts testify that that was not the case. With tensions already high in the state, it's safe to say a lot is resting on the verdict. Outside the courthouse today, attorney Ben Crump held a press conference to talk about those cases. They could have gave him a ticket. That's what they're doing, traffic citations. It reminds you of George Floyd. That was a misdemeanor. They could have gave him a ticket for that. But when it's black people in America, they engage in the most use of force. And it ends up with deadly consequences. According to the mayor of Brooklyn Center, the officer who shot Wright sent in her letter of resignation today alongside the police chiefs. Newsy's James Packard has the latest details on that investigation. Well, Christian, what we know is that Kim Potter is off the force tonight in Brooklyn Center. She resigned 
Tuesday morning. The mayor said he hadn't necessarily accepted that resignation after getting a question about whether or not he would fire her. That is something that activists were calling for, but firing resignation, she's off the force regardless. It's not going to be enough for activists who want her charged in Dante Wright's death. There is obviously a thorough investigation ongoing from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension that digs through these kinds of events, just as they did when George Floyd died as well. That is something that is ongoing. It is sometimes a tedious process, and there's not often a lot of information this early in the process, but we're going to keep digging for it. We're going to keep asking those questions to the BCA about where they are in that process. And the mayor wants Keith Ellison, the attorney general in this state, to take on any potential charges against Kim Potter or any other officers who were involved in this incident. So we're going to keep our eye on it, Christian. But for now, it's obviously early, a lot of developments already. When you're back, we'll pull you out of a dizzying news cycle to tell you what else is trending online. Part of the hope in talking about cryptocurrency is that if I talk about this stuff enough, I'll be able to internalize the terms and their meanings. No luck so far, but we'll keep going anyway. Here's what's trending. Cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum hit record highs Tuesday ahead of the initial public offering of Coinbase, the largest cryptocurrency exchange in the US. Coinbase's revenue has soared over the last year and their valuation is in the neighborhood of $100 billion. This is another sign of the growing acceptance of digital currencies in the financial industry. Just last month, Visa became the first major payments network to accept cryptocurrency as payment. Experts who I'm sure speak to each other in ones and zeros say that this is a pretty big milestone for crypto investors and skeptical Wall Street folks. But given the history of Bitcoin, can you blame the skeptics? Back in 2010, a dude used 10,000 Bitcoin to pay for two Papa John's pizzas. A single Bitcoin was worth a fraction of a cent then, but it's now worth more than $60,000. Personally, I don't trust anybody who would spend that amount of money on a Papa John's pizza or any pizza for that matter. They're not what you think they are. They're smarter. They're faster. They're organized. So the zombies from World War Z basically started a union. The trailer for Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead dropped today, and by the looks of it, it's a heist movie that involves a crew of badasses dropping into a zombie-controlled Las Vegas to retrieve a reward. The idea for this film was first announced back in 2007. Since then, writer and director Zack Snyder has done zombies and armies, so why not just throw them together? Army of the Dead is scheduled to hit theaters during a sort of theatrical crossroads during this pandemic. AMC theaters just barely avoided bankruptcy, reopening many of their US locations last month and getting a boost from the gigantic monster mash Godzilla vs. Kong. Meanwhile, Arclight Cinemas and Pacific Theaters just announced they're closing their curtains for good. Army of the Dead will be available in theaters May 14th before hitting Netflix May 24th. There have been a number of unexpected occurrences over the last year or so, but I gotta say, reading that Stakem reignited their feud with Neil deGrasse Tyson is like the Wagyu beef of randomness, if you get what I'm saying. The beef brand turned up the heat on Tyson after the astrophysicist tweeted, the good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. Stakem responded by saying that Tyson could be doing more harm than good by making people even more skeptical of science with his messaging during a time of unprecedented misinformation. And some people are really loving this public dragging. I gotta be honest though, I said that this beef had been reignited, which is an overstatement. All of this is lukewarm Twitter fodder at best. Back in 2018, Stakem said, who cares to one of NDT's random factoids, which started the feud. Tyson hasn't directly responded to Stakem on Twitter, but you can almost see him winding up for a deep dive on the chemical process of preserving frozen, thinly sliced prepackaged steaks, which I'll pass. We are a year and some change into this pandemic, and in that time, I've attended a few digital worship services. One big reason is so I can tell my mom I did so on days like Easter Sunday. Many places of worship made their services available online in lieu of in-person services. Newsy's Amber Strong takes a closer look at what impact that's had and whether the digital worship offering will stick around in the future. During the pandemic, watching a religious service online, if you want him to guide you, if you want him to teach you, 
became as easy as streaming your favorite show. As COVID-19 shutdowns increased, many places of worship made the digital switch, allowing congregants to worship at home. Now that new normal may be here to stay, at least in some form. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine I would be a digital rabbi. For some, the transition was seamless. So when the pandemic hit, it was, we were already streaming. Infrastructure complications forced others to play catch up. Justin Gibney with the Churches Helping Churches campaign says health disparities, unemployment, and a technological divide cause some to struggle. When you have sometimes an older uh, congregation that may not give online or whatever it be, the, 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 the funds coming in the church just weren't flowing like before. A new Gallup poll shows U.S. church, mosque, and synagogue membership declined in 2020 to less than 50 percent for the first time in the polling group's 80-year history. While that may have more to do with a larger downward trend, some religious institutions did struggle with pandemic attendance. What we found is that one in five Americans who attended church before the pandemic has never attended church during the pandemic, either in person or digitally. But that wasn't the case for every church in every synagogue. We found also that we've been able to um, reach people who, you know, children of members who have now gone off to college and wanted to participate in services and now could do so very, very easily. a sense of community and keep people engaged, Rabbi Paul Cohen of Temple Jeremiah says the Illinois synagogue revamped the experience. In Judaism, uh, we call it visual tefillah. Tefillah is the Hebrew word for prayer, so visual prayer. So having images that uh, complement the prayer that's being shared at a given moment. This message goes deep. The Potter's House, a church in Dallas, also made changes, including the addition of a virtual congregation via an interactive screen that we already had an online presence, a pretty robust online presence. Uh, but we had to actually take it up about five notches in reference to uh, literally going virtual. The church has been hosting conferences for years on practical ways to make the digital switch and says now is the time to consider gradual upgrades, even if it starts with a smartphone and a tripod. We, we have no idea what's going to go on with, with the vaccine, how long it's going to last, will we need to have another booster. It just makes all the sense in the world to, to invest in some type of infrastructure. Because like school and work, a hybrid future may be inevitable. People do really like having hybrid options available to them. I was very against, you know, this using cameras and broadcasting, and it just, it seemed, uh, you know, just kind of antithetical to what worship is supposed to be. For some people, I mean, they enjoy participating in worship, sitting in their pajamas on their couch with a glass of wine. You know, it's just, <laughs> and... You know, they're participating and they're having a meaningful experience and it's working for them. You know, why should I say you can't do that? Amber Strong, Newsy. I know there's a connection between places of worship and wine, but I ain't never heard of a casual glass during service. There are now 12 emergency facilities to deal with the influx of unaccompanied migrant children coming over the U.S. southern border, and more are opening on a weekly basis. To try and ease the overcrowding, some U.S. families are fostering the kids. But as Newsy learned, many migrant children aren't getting tested for COVID before getting released to those homes. Newsy's Ben Shimiso talked to one family about their fostering experience so far. This thing is in English and Spanish, which is nice. More than a thousand miles from the southern border, a young Indianapolis couple is parenting and housing migrant children for weeks at a time. Love knows no language, so, you know, we're here to show you guys love. While the Biden administration scrambles to house a record number of unaccompanied minors in packed border sites, convention centers and military bases, there is a better alternative. Bye one that relies on the kindness of everyday Americans. They have their own bedroom and their own space, and it's just them in the house versus, you know, hundreds of kids. Billy and Tori are among hundreds of foster parents nationwide stepping up during the pandemic to give migrant kids a safe home until they're cleared to reunite with their families in the U.S. They ask that we only use their first names out of concern for their safety and the safety of the kids. 
we have a teen mom and then her two-year-old daughter and then the mom's six-year-old sister. The two sisters and the baby arrived at the border two months ago from Honduras, hoping to reunite with their mother in Texas. The 17-year-old will FaceTime mom pretty much every night. The reunion could happen in a matter of days as soon as the government is done vetting the mom. It's super bittersweet for us because, I mean, they've been with us for a month, so relationships have formed, but I just think we have to remember the bigger goal, and that's that these kids are going to do better with their family. Over 21,000 migrant children are currently in government custody, an all-time high. Only around 10 percent of them can be housed in independent foster homes at the moment, but the pressure on organizations like Bethany Christian Services to recruit more foster parents is mounting. At this point, as soon as a child leaves and is able to be reunited, we're asked to take another child pretty quickly. Billy and Tori, who became licensed foster parents last year through Bethany, get modest reimbursements for expenses. They have already housed eight migrant kids in the past six months, and they're only getting started. I come home from work and the kids like run to the door and give me this huge hug. And I'm like, you know, they had known me for two weeks. This group loves taking baths. Oh, yes. um, that's like their favorite thing to do. And it's because <laughs> they've never taken a bath before. This is a 30 to 60 minute bath every night yeah, happening in our like, house. <laughs> like swimming under the water in the bathtub. and Wear their swimsuits in the yeah. bathtub. For how long? Are you going to be doing this? I mean, it could be a year, it could be 20 years. Just depends on the need. Ben Shamiso, Indianapolis, Newsy. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. I check it pretty often, so if you'd like to give me a compliment or send along some really interesting, specifically targeted hate mail, I'll definitely see it. A famous American ballerina is speaking out against a problem in dance culture that has emotionally damaged generations of people. National reporter Elizabeth Ruiz has more. Katie, do you have a new lid on today? Yeah. Catherine Morgan has had a love for dance all her life, and she's good at it too. At age 17, she was hired at the New York City Ballet, where she soon became a soloist. She was living out her dream. But then at 21, she was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. In very layman's terms, your body attacks itself. And as a professional athlete, it was terrifying because my muscles started to disintegrate, my hair fell out, and I gained 45 pounds in six weeks. It's when she got back into the dance world seven years later that she realized a huge problem in the industry had not gone away. You still have to be exceedingly small, and you still have to fit that mold, and the standard is so extreme. Um, and I just didn't fit that. Catherine says roles were taken away from her and she was told awful things about her body. She says body shaming is something almost every dancer can relate to. Its impact is harmful and long lasting. I have people saying, dear Catherine, I'm 12 years old and I've been on a diet for three years and I'll never look like that and my dream is to dance, but I think I'm too big. Um, I've had 55 year old women message me and say, I have an eating disorder from when I was in ballet at age 16 and I'm still dealing with it at 55. I have personal friends who I danced with growing up who will never go to the ballet ever again because of the experiences they've had. For years, Catherine says ballet dancers have been expected to live and die for the art form, jeopardizing their physical and mental health. It's a very um, hierarchy-based system where the person at the front of the room is literally God, and they will determine your career, they will determine the roles that you get, and if you don't please them, that's it. It's a very also opinionated job. Catherine says it's time for this toxic culture to change. It's time we have to start challenging our eyes and what we think is the standard. Why, why is it like that? Because it's, that's how it is in ballet. Why? You know, it's, it's time to start challenging that viewpoint. One dancer who already has been challenging that viewpoint is Bailey Ann Vincent. She's the artistic director of Company 360, a body positive dance company. We do not discriminate with the dancers we hire based upon the skeletons that they were born with, right? So size, height, those things aren't a factor whatsoever because I feel that our skeletons don't determine 
our ability to move an audience. Bailey says she hires based off of technique, talent, work ethic, and role modeling. You know, if I'm considering who am I going to give this big role, I'll truly think who's the dancer who's always reaching out to the other dancers and making them feel welcome? Who's the one who's always in the corner doing a step that they're not good at? four or five more times. Bailey says dancers of all shapes, sizes, and abilities need to speak out to end this misperception of what strength and beauty is. She applauds Katherine Morgan for using her voice for change. There's this culture of silence that we've all just sort of quietly accepted because we were told the generation before us had to deal with that. To see someone just speak to it, it was just invigorating. Catherine says skeptics will say there's an element of physics to ballet and that's why it's valuable to be thin. However, she believes there's a happy medium. Well, I think the problem with ballet is that oftentimes body type is the first thing we look at. We don't look at the artistry first, we don't look at the talent first, and it's it's starting to dampen the industry because so many of us can't get to be that small and so the problem is you lose your talent pool. The first step to change is talking about it. The second step is having teachers who are more aware of phrasing in their classes, how they say something to a student. You know, there's a big difference between pull your stomach in and support with your core. Both Catherine and Bailey agree change won't happen overnight, but it can happen as dancers now become teachers in the future. And if you personally have experienced body shaming, this is Catherine's message for you. You are worth so much more than what you look like in the mirror. You are worth so much more than the size that the tag says in your pants. That's not what makes you a good human being. You know, it's what's on the inside, it's how you treat other people, it's are you being a role model for other people, are you going after your goals and dreams. Um, that's what defines you, not what you look like in the mirror. In Salt Lake City, Utah, I'm Elizabeth Ruiz reporting. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow for more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from news here headed your way right now.